so they don't trust even you come with generation to help. And then also, they are so little used to that, that they don't know how to behave in a way. So to give you an idea, once we came with that, we have a, a kind of mobile vehicle, and to reach to a village where we go every week, about 50 kilometers away, we had to cross a river. So now, in the, in the summertime, the river is quite big, and there's a big pothole inside the river. So once we missed it, and fell in the hole. So now, the village people who, who we are going, coming to help, they're all watching, and they're asking us money to take us out. <laughs> so, what do you do? You start getting angry, you say, we're coming to help you, you ask money to come to get out of the river to help you. <laughs> so that's where the, the abbot of my monastery said, no, that's really when we have to be a bodhisattva. No? Just wanting to help, don't expect anything in return. <laughs> So that needs some kind of, you know, you have to develop those qualities little by little. So now, how to develop those qualities? Now, when we are in the midst of a quite demanding and challenging life, of course, we all grow from interacting with others. That's how we build up what we are, our emotional life, uh, the, the ordinary experience of relating to other sentient beings. That's how we think of love and compassion. That's how we have other sometimes negative emotions. They all only exist and make sense because of being interdependent with others. If we were suspended alone in space, love and compassion would strictly no meaning. And hatred too. None of those human emotions would make any sense. It's all due to the interdependence with others. But at the same time, there's so much of it. And we are sort of quite, uh, we are not that strong to, to know how to deal with the arising of powerful emotions, how to uh, deal with them so that we don't uh, have the right emotion with the right level for the right situation and so forth. We either overreact or underreact or we, we, we don't sort of generate the right emotion for the right situation, and then sometimes that's why we get in suffering and trouble. And now, so we learn right sort of being plunged in, in life, that's how we develop, that's how our brain also sort of get wired, with the resulting of all this visual, auditive, emotional, this exposure to the world, that's how it builds up our, 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 our the way our brain functions, so we sort of the image of all what we have uh, taken in from the outer world. But it could be also quite overwhelming. And we don't have this notion of cultivating certain qualities, certain strengths. We do so, to, of course, to a great extent to education and to the example given by those with whom we grow, our parents, our friends, our environment, our teachers. Uh, but in terms of a deep uh, sort of directed change toward better becoming a, a good human being, you know, sometimes we are a bit at loss at how to proceed with that. And also, often we, in difficult environments, and that happens tragically so much in our world, you know, people who are abused, who are in, in a country that is not at peace, and those suffering can be so disruptive and so overwhelming, lacking love and tenderness, being exposed to violence and cruelty and abuse, that has a really devast can have a devastating effect on the quality of our, of, of our experience of life. So in a sense, that notion of cultivating something for becoming a, a good human being, we are sometimes too weak to try to become strong. It's like an athlete who needs to train to gain this very uh, extraordinary uh, bodily faculty of, of, of jumping eight feet high or running that fast. But if that person is too feeble to even train, then he cannot reach to that level. So that's why the notion of spending some time precisely 
to transform the way we experience the world. It is not a waste of time. It is not a selfish, uh, that's one of the things people say, you know, if you take some time out just to train your mind, well, that's another word for meditation. Now, meditation just means to cultivate something. In Sanskrit, bhavana. And Tibetan gom means to become familiar with something. So meditation is not just sitting there and say, okay, now I have to, have to empty my mind by all means and relax a little bit so I feel, I feel good for a while. And then again I'm taken in that whirlpool of the world. I maybe slight benefit, but not much. So really it's about cultivating, cultivating some qualities, cultivating a correct understanding of reality, cultivating uh, an understanding of the nature of mind, cultivating an understanding of how thoughts arise, how they multiply, how they are chain reaction that soon overpower our, our own mind. So all this comes through meditation. There's an analytical aspect to that, which is to say, try to understand impermanence. It's, it's not an obvious concept. I mean, what? Usually, actually, we try, we, we want to perceive things as the opposite of impermanent. Our wish is things should last. What is mine should be mine tomorrow. I, of course, I should be alive tomorrow. A particular condition or situation I mean, I, I want it to last. I want also to be alive. Those who are dear to me, they must last by all means. So, of course, things will somehow last and remain together for a while, as, as long as a certain number of interdependent conditions come together. But this is the very nature of things that every single moment they change. That's how there's a process of aging. That's why this wood that must have been such a sort of clean, shaved, white wood is now looking in a very different way every single moment. And that's the very nature of phenomena. If anything in the, in the universe will remain absolutely identical to itself, two consecutive minute moments it will be frozen there. That means the very process of cause and effect and change will have been interrupted. There has to be change. It's all dynamic. So why is it important to spend some time just, just, just to give an example of what an analytical meditation can be, to, to go to that process of understanding. First, looking at the impermanence of the seasons, of, of our life, of, of youth and old age, and then this minute constant impermanence that allows this a larger process to happen. Why does that matter? Why should that be an object of meditation? Because precisely, once we have this strong grasping that things are lasting or should last, then we have a kind of solidification of the world. We reify the world. This is mine, this is me, this is others, this is intrinsically beautiful, it's going to remain so, this is my friend, this is my enemy. And then we start making all those sort of uh, attaching these very strong concepts or perception of things as being separate autonomous entities uh, which have autonomous qualities, and then that's it. So that's not the way the phenomenal world is. So if it's not the way, what's going to happen? Our feelings of attraction or desire and repulsion are going to be based on that. This is permanent and this is bad, or this is permanent and this is desirable. And so we function in that way, and that has to end up in suffering and frustration because we are just at odds with reality. So sometimes that reality is going to happen in a big way, like something that we think is permanent, we lose it all of a sudden, and something that some, our life comes to an end, the life of those that are dear to us comes to an end, and that's a big shock because we, we cannot see things in that way. So to perceive the interdependence, to perceive impermanence help us to be attuned to reality and then everything is but the natural flow of that. Of course, something can be sad, but at least we don't say it should not have happened. 
Why? 